Hello, I'm Dr. Dennis DeSilvi, and today we're going to demonstrate the cardiac exam. It's so our patient for today, Bill. Greetings, good to meet you. I always start my exam by looking very carefully at the patient. There's an awful lot that can be gained by just carefully examining the respiratory pattern of the patient, uh, the nature of their precordium, the anterior part of their chest over the heart. The other thing I, I always do when I'm about to start my exam is I carefully feel the pulse very gently, get some sense of the timing of the pulse. Is it regular or is it irregular? Are there any extra beats, premature beats as we call them? Bill's pulse is nice and regular. Bill tells me he's a runner, so he's got a very regular very slow pulse. It's a rate of about, oh, I'd say it's probably about 60 uh, at this point in time. Having done that, I then have Bill put his hands at his side, and I look care very carefully at his chest, watching for the rise and fall of his chest, and looking very carefully. The precordium, or the area of the chest in front of the heart, is right here. Remember, the heart's about the size of your fist and sits right here, and his precordial impulse is going to be right in this area here, in the fourth or fifth intercostal space, usually about the midclavicular line or just slightly below the nipple. Bill's got a nice symmetrical chest. He has no evidence of any depression of his sternum, which we know to be something called pectus excavatum. I then look at the back of Bill's chest. And I'll tell you a little secret from this cardiologist about doing the chest e exam. I'm one of the few people that really looks carefully at Bill's back. So I always look very carefully at his back for respiratory motion, for the skin condition of his back, uh, whether he has any abnormality of his musculature in the back or any curvature of the spine. And that's an important part of the careful exam. Bill, I'd like you to breathe very normally. And while I'm in this position, I begin from the top down by examining the carotid pulses. I'm going to put my fingers just gently at about the angle of his jaw. You can probably see my fingers pulsating slightly as I feel Bill's carotid pulse, which is very normal. I then come over and feel the carotid pulse on the other side, which is also normal. Also in this position, I look very carefully at the jugular veins. I look particularly for signs of any increasing jugular venous pressure in the seated position, looking more at the inter internal than the external um, jugular pulses. But you want to look very carefully for the pulsations. Bill has no evidence of any pulsations in this position. Remember that the sternal angle is about five centimeters above the right atrium. So his jugular venous pressure, at least in the upright position, is normal. The next thing I do is I take out my stethoscope, I begin my exam, initially by examining the carotid pulses for any carotid bruits with the diaphragm of the stethoscope. Hold your breath, don't talk. I listen on the left, hold your breathe now, I let him catch his breath, and then hold your breath again, don't talk. Breathe normally. It's very good. Thank you. Just catch your breath. It's very important to make sure that they hold their breath. It's also very important to make sure that you tell them not to talk. Because if they talk while you've got your stethoscope there, you'll hear it very loudly. So that one thing, just hold your breath, don't talk, is important. I then begin, I've examined the chest. Now what I'm going to do is palpate. And palpate builds apical impulse with... This is the most sensitive part of your hand for feeling cardiac impulses. So you want to gently put it on the chest wall and feel. And I can feel Bill's cardiac impulse. So you're going to feel the apical impulse about 75% of the time. There are some people where you just won't feel it at all. While I'm here, I also feel along the, right stern the left sternal border for any abnormal pulmonary pulses. There are three, four major areas that you need to concentrate on in feeling the heart. You want to feel at the apex. 
You want to look for abnormal impulses in this area, just to the left laterally from the sternal edge, because if there's any enlargement of the ventricle, you'll feel it here. If there's enlargement of the left atrium pushing forward on the cardiac structures, you'll feel it here. And if there's enlargement of the pulmonary vasculature, you'll feel it higher up in the second and third space, intercostal space along the left sternal border. So pulmonary, left atrial enlargement, cardiac enlargement secondary to heart failure here, and the normal apical impulses down here. Having felt those impulse, apical impulse, I then start to listen. So I've looked, I've felt, and now I'm going to listen. I always start with the diaphragm of my stethoscope because I want to try and hear if there are any low frequency sounds or gallops. And you're going to pick up most murmurs with the, with the, with the bell of your stethoscope, rather. So I'm starting with the bell, and I'm putting the bell right in the apex. Nice normal impulse, and in Bill's case, I can actually feel, I can hear the normal splitting of his first heart sound, which is unusual, but in Bill's case, again, because he's an athlete, relatively well-trained, I can hear both mitral and tricuspid closure. I then, having done that, take the diaphragm of my stethoscope and listen at the apex also. I then listen in the tricuspid area along the left sternal border. I listen again in the pulmonic area along the left sternal border. And I listen in the aortic listening area. I also will move my stethoscope up and listen in the supraclavicular area, very carefully to hear if there are any bruies or extra vascular flow sounds in that area. So again, as you develop your technique of listening to the heart, develop a method that works for you. I start at the apex in the mitral area, move to the tricuspid area, then to the pulmonic area, and then to the aortic listening area. Uh, I do that because it simply helps me to consciously, in a sense, follow the flow of the blood through the heart, coming into the left ventricle, and then moving up and along. If you want to listen the other way, you can, but just develop a technique that works for you as an individual. Also remember when you're listening to heart sounds, what you want to do is listen to isolated segments of the cardiac cycle. Listen to the first heart sound, Listen to systole, the area between the first heart sound and the second heart sound. Listen to the second heart sound, and then listen to diastole. You cannot possibly put the whole cardiac cycle into one listening event. You have to isolate the individual events. What I'll do with Bill now is ask you, if you will, to just slide back in the bed a bit. Sure. Just a little bit more, Bill, if you will. Good. I'd like you to lie down. Good. You just get real comfortable with your hands at your side. <clears throat> I've now got Bill in the recumbent position. His head is slightly elevated. I always start out with a slight degree of elevation because if you're flat on the examining table, it's very uncomfortable. And I like look again at Bill's jugular veins. I have him bring his neck up slightly. I ask him to roll his head towards me slightly. And again, you're going to see the internal jugular vein right in this region best with tangential light. You can then look straight ahead. And I look again at Bill's precordium, looking to see if I can see the precordial impulse. And I can. It's right here in about the fourth intercostal space, just about at the midclavicular line. And if you, I put my hands on there, you actually can see my hand move up as as the apical impulse touches my hand. And Bill's got a normal apical impulse. It's about the size of a quarter, and it's located right here. I then look carefully again 
looking at the area to see if there's any evidence for any pulsation in this area, which would indicate abnormalities of heart function, any pulsations in this area, which would indicate enlargement of the left atrium, and any pulsations in the second and third left intercostal space, which would indicate evidence for pulmonic or pulmonary arterial enlargement. I also feel very carefully along the left sternal border, feeling for any right ventricular lift or any other abnormal pulsations. And having done that, I'm then going to start to listen again. Again, starting with my bell, listening at the apex. And remember that when you're listening with your bell, you want to put just practically no pressure at all on your stethoscope. And listen very carefully. And then switch to your diaphragm. And if I suspect that there's a regurgitant mitral valve lesion, I'm going to listen out in the axilla. And then come back. And then creep over to the left sternal border in the tricuspid listening area. And then I'm going to move up to the pulmonic listening area where I listen next. And while I'm in the pulmonic area, I'll look very carefully at Bill's inspiratory and expiratory cycle. Inspiration, expiration, watching the stomach, inspiration. And I listen for splitting of the second heart sound. And I watch his abdomen for any evidence of any, for the rise and fall of his abdomen with inspiration and expiration. And I'm looking for the expiratory, the inspiratory widening, and the widening of inspiration of the second heart sound. As the blood flow in the lungs increases, pulmonic closure is delayed. And actually with the increase in blood volume in the lungs, the left ventricle doesn't fill as well so aortic closure is earlier. So it's really the widening of the second heart sound is a combination of later closure of the pulmonic valve and earlier closure of the aortic valve. Now if I hear any abnormal sounds, Bill's got a very normal cardiac exam, but if I hear abnormal sounds, then I am even more careful about isolating the cardiac cycle. So I'll listen very carefully to S1, very careful to this, carefully to the systolic interval, very carefully to S2, and very careful to diastole. Uh, let's say, for example, that I heard a murmur on Bill in the aortic listening area. I would listen very carefully, usually with my diaphragm, And I would listen carefully for the presence or absence of the aortic second sound. And then I would listen and feel for an extra sound or a thrill, which is a sound made by the abnormal flow. And that's felt, again, with just this part of your hands very carefully. And occasionally you can go up in the lower neck region and you'll feel it in the carotid pulsation. Bill, thank you very much. Let's have you sit back up and slide down again. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And that completes, the, for me, the normal cardiac exam. I do want to demonstrate one other technique, and that is that very often, particularly if you're trying to listen for murmurs at the apex and you think you hear something, I don't do it in every patient, but you put the patient into the left lateral decubitus position. Bill, if you'd slide back again, I don't want to leave without showing that. Lie down, and I want you to move towards me mm -hmm. just a little bit. Good. And just lie down again. 
come back, just relax against my arm like that. This way, what I've done is I've put Bill over into the left lateral decubitus position. This brings the apical impulse closer to the chest wall. So you can really see Bill's apical impulse quite well right about here. Let me just try and bring that out a little bit with a little bit of tangential light. I think you can all see that fairly well, that his apical impulse is right in this region here. And then what I do, particularly when you're listening, if you want to check for a ventricular gallop, a left ventricular S3 or S4 gallop, listen very carefully at the apex. In the left lateral decubitus position. This is also the position that when you begin to listen for murmurs secondary to mitral stenosis or mitral narrowing, you'll hear them very localized right here in the left lateral decubitus position. Okay, thank you very much. You can slide back and lie flat again and sit up again and just slide down. Okay. Okay. So what we have done is examined Bill's heart very carefully. We've gone through some very basic pieces of the cardiovascular physical examination. Remember that it consists of basically, first of all, you start with a good history, but then you do a good physical that consists of observation, looking at Bill's chest, looking at the cardiac impulses. Uh, it consists of palpation, feeling the cardiac impulses, using the, your hand very carefully to assess the apical impulse and any signs of chamber enlargement. It consists of percussion, particularly when one is trying to obtain the exact position of the left cardiac border. And then it consists of auscultation or listening with your stethoscope. Remember the important cardiac listening areas, the mitral area, the tricuspid area, the pulmonic area, and the aortic listening area. Remember the importance of the position of the patient. You want to examine the patient upright recumbent and in the left lateral decubitus position if indicated. Having done all that, you should be able to come up with a very complete assessment of the state of your patient's cardiovascular status to guide further workup, evaluation, and possibly treatment.